Hi, I'm Natalie Jill, fat loss expert turned high performance coach. When odds are stacked against us, how do we shift and create everything from nothing? How do we level up when we aren't feeling it yet or we've had a big setback? On this podcast, I'll be talking to some of the most inspiring and courageous men and women on this planet who at their worst learned how to achieve success greater than they ever dreamed possible. Leveling up and creating everything from nothing. I interviewed Mickey Agarwal on the perfect day at the perfect moment. I was battling my own self-imposed stop conversation in my mind about maybe needing to give up something I had been working on and believed in. But interviewing her and the conversation I have with her shifted me right out of it. And I know it's going to do the same for you today if you're in that place. Mickey is a true social entrepreneur in every sense of the phrase. Now, she was raised by parents who never complained and who always found solutions to any and every problem. And she learned early on that there is always, always a solution. Now, Mickey shares so many incredible stories and journeys of her pursuit to never give up, how she was the founder of the acclaimed farm-to-table alternative pizza concept called Wild. They now have three locations in New York City, one in Guatemala, one more on the way. And she is also, ladies, listen to this, she co-founded Thinks. If you don't know what that is, that is a high-tech, period-proof, yes, I said period-proof, underwear brand and led the company as CEO to a valuation of, get this, $150 million and to Fast Company's most innovative companies of 2017, all while helping tens of millions of women, period better, as she says. She most recently founded a new innovative company called Tushy. Wait till you hear about this. Oh my gosh, her energy, her creativity, her pursuit of never giving up, Wait till you meet her today and learn exactly how Mickey has over and over again created everything from nothing. Today on Leveling Up, I've got Mickey Agrawal, and I don't even know to, where to start with her. I'm so excited. I have so many questions to ask her today. She's a serial entrepreneur. This one's near and dear to my heart. She was the first to create a gluten-free farm-to-table pizza in New York City. I don't know if you know this, Mickey, but I'm a celiac, so I'm dying to hear about that. Thank you Yay. for creating that. She created the Think Period Proof Underwear. I didn't even know what that was, but wait till you hear about this, ladies. Oh my gosh. She she created a bladder leakage product. She is now working on a product called Tushy, which gets rid of the the gross toilet paper problem. She's a a best-selling author of two books. Her list goes on and on and on. She's a true serial entrepreneur, but she created every single one of these concepts from nothing. Nothing was handed to her. I am dying to get into this with her today on how she came up with the ideas, how she even did this, how she made things go from nothing to everything. Mickey, thank you so much for being here today. So happy to be here. Oh my gosh. Where do we even start? Because most people say they're a serial entrepreneur and like really they just do a lot of different things, but nothing really takes off and it's a success, but you've created these massive things that are success. Like where, take us back. Like how did this even start? Were you born with a million ideas? Did you have the resources to create? Who were no, you? No. I mean, my father came to this country to act to Canada when, uh, with $5 in his pocket. Okay. You know, and then my mother came here from Japan, you know, having like speaking very little English. Okay. And then my parents met in 1974 and against all odds, like disrupted societal preconceptions of marrying interracially and fell in love, married each other. And within one year or, you know, of, of really kind of, well, of getting married. So it happened mm-hmm. they actually, they got together in 1974, but then a few years, a couple of years later, they had my older sister and then they had my, my twin sister and I. So okay. the three of us were born within one year. And, um, and then, and then we moved to Montreal, Canada. And I think, you know, growing up, I just saw my parents who had, you know, just, we were very middle class, you know, once on a, on a modest engineer salary, my mom was a stay at home mom mm-hmm. and raised us, you know, without really any help. And, you know, whenever they would see stuff in community, in the community or in the, in the city or in the town that, that was missing or lacking of, they wouldn't complain about it. They would just solve it. And wow. I just watched them. Like, for example, growing up, there was no gifted children summer camp. Okay. There was summer camp for like people, you know, sports summer camps and regular summer camps, but there was no summer camp for gifted children. And so my mom, without like, again, with broken English, without any resources, any money, any connections, anything, 
figured it out and created Montreal's first gifted children's summer camp. And it ran for 15 plus years with hundreds of children and, um, and just figured it out, you know, and then growing up. Yeah. Yeah. And then when we were like in elementary school, my parents were like, Oh, electronics are going to be the future. This is in like the mm-hmm. early 1990s. There was no cell phones, no computers. There was still no personal computers, of course, nothing. And the first Commodore 64 started coming up and then Apple, just like slowly, slowly. And they were like, this is going to be the future. So they were like, children need to know about this. They created the first electronics children's kit that taught kids how to make electronics like breadboards and burglar alarms and okay. lights flash and stick. And then they just sold these all over Canada. And they just kind of like made these things all our lives. And we just, we oh. just watched them never complain, never give up. And we just were like, all right, I guess when we see a problem in society or in the community, we're just going to go fix it. I love that your parents, what a gift they gave you. Like that's so incredible. And I don't know that I've ever heard somebody that direct with what their parents did for them. So when you would have a complaint, because everyone has a complaint, how did your mom handle that? Like when you would be claimed, would she just automatically go to, how are we going to solve that? How did she coach you through that? Yeah. I mean, I think we, I mean, honestly, I don't, recall having any time to complain growing up because we were like they put us in every we we went to language monday to friday with french school saturday we had japanese school and sunday we had hindi school so we went to school our parents tricked us into going to school seven days (laughs) and then we had like soccer and music classes and we had all these like all the things and so we just didn't have any literally any time to complain so you just had to learn to figure it out like to learn to figure it out we just kept going and just kept moving yeah. 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 So how did you know as a little girl, like, did you know you were just going to figure things out and create things or what, what would, did you think you were going to be when you grew up when you were that little girl? Um, I, um, I did not know I was going to be an entrepreneur. I mean, I didn't even know it was a possibility. I didn't even know, like it was in, there was no Facebook, there was no entrepreneurial yeah. anything. It wasn't in the zeitgeist at all culturally. So no, I only really figured out that entrepreneurship was a possibility when I was like 22 years old in New York City. Okay. I went to like my first party and I was in my first party where I was invited into the VIP section of an Armani party when Armani was like, mm-hmm. cool. <laughs> and, um, and I was standing in the VIP section and standing in front of me was this guy named Graham Hill who had started a company called Tree Hugger and another company. And we just sat there in line talking. We ended up spending the whole evening just chatting and talking. And I was like, wait, you started a company? Wait, how did you do it? Wait, wait, you can do that? And then I just was so, it was just mind blowing. And then he next day invited me to this brunch with a bunch of his entrepreneurial friends. And then I met with them and I just sat and I was 22. They were all in their mid thirties and they just took me under their wing. And I just like, I just, that's how I learned about entrepreneurship. Wow. Yeah. Cause I, I know what you're talking about too. Like I grew up in DC. So like that whole East coast vibe, it's not a very entrepreneur area. Like you just think you go to college, you go to, you know, you get a job. Like that's right. what we're taught. It's that's very it. different than like, I live in California now where it's this, everyone's an entrepreneur. <laughs> right. Exactly. So, but back then nobody, I mean, it was like investment banking, management, consulting, yeah. it was legal, going to law school, becoming a lawyer, becoming a doctor. It was like real vocations that you would, and professions that you would get into entrepreneurship was certainly not one of those options. And so when my, when I sort of discovered that entrepreneurship was a thing, I just started thinking more about it and just saying, Oh, what would be something that I would want to start? I never came up with an idea or even thought about, wait, how would I even raise the money? I had student loan debt. I didn't have it. I just didn't have any savings. Like I was just still, it was just not even an option until you know, I went, I, so my first job out of college was at, at an investment banking. So after Mm -hmm. Cornell, I, got a job directly across to World Trade Center. And okay. my job started on September 1st, 2001. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. And so my subway stop every morning was to World Trade Center. Mm-hmm. I, would, I would basically get tea with my girlfriend who worked on the 100th floor. And then I would walk across the street to my job. And I did two months training still there. So I was there for like two and a half months. I officially started the first week mm-hmm. of September. And 9-11 happened mm-hmm. and 700 people in my girlfriend's office died on that day. Oh, gosh. You know, she worked oh on the gosh. 100th floor. She went down to get coffee. She, I thought she was dead for a month. I didn't know. Wow. But what a- Two people in my office died. And, um, and it was the first and only day in my life that I slept through my alarm clock. Oh the my gosh. First and only day to this day, I'm the lightest sleeper. And I would, I just, if any like tink sound, I would That's wake bizarre. up. What a and, bizarre coincidence. Yeah. And so to me, what I learned, you know, 
when I found out what happened and I, I came to, I just, what, what came to me was that, oh my God, the mystery of life is that you never know when it's going to end. Yeah. You know? The time was absolutely now to make every moment count. You know, right now a meteor could hit the planet and we can all be incinerated and die. You know, like we just never know what freak might accident or some crazy yeah. like 9-11 would happen. And in that moment, I just saw my life flash before my eyes. And I feel like so many of us have had an aha moment where we yeah. had a family member pass away or we've been like near death experience or we've had some kind of a thing that just shakes us awake to our mortality. Totally. And that was my moment. I was 22 years old and I, you know, I've had like little like bike accident kind of things, but this was really like, I really could have been there. And I, um, and I was just really shaken up from it. Yeah. I can imagine. Yeah. And that's when I was like, all right, like I have to make every moment count. And so I wrote down three things I wanted to do with my life. Okay. And the first was to play soccer professionally. Okay. Why not? The second was to make movies. That would be on my list too. I'm just right. <laughs> right. <laughs> so random. <laughs> okay. And then the, the second was, yeah, play soccer professionally and then make movies and then the uh -huh. third was start a business. Start a business. Okay. But you didn't know what you just said, start no, a business. Okay. Just start a business, like whatever. Okay. And I'd played soccer all four years at college in Cornell D one. I played my whole life. I was obsessed with it. I, you know, played the highest level and yeah. I found out that the New York magic was holding tryouts in Brooklyn. And, and while I was working my investment banking job, I snuck out of my investment banking job, tried out against all top D one athletes from around the country. You know, they would cut teams, cut people, every single tryout. And I kept going through like all the way to the very end, two and a half months into the tryouts, the coach puts the, you know, the list of all the, the starting lineup on the, on the, on the bulleted board. Yeah. And there I was on that starting lineup. And I was like, Oh my God, I just made the starting lineup of the New York magic soccer team. I'm going to quit my job. This is epic. Wow. But then, but then I was like, you know what, wait, let me just play my first game, see how it goes and then quit my job. Cause who knows what's going to happen. So I played my first game and then within the first eight minutes of my professional career, juke a few couple of players in, I crossed the ball, the striker puts in the back of the neck. And in the, and then like, while I, as soon as I crossed the ball, a defender mm -hmm. came in, took out my leg and I heard the telltale snap and then, Oh tore my, my gosh. ACL. Yeah. And tore my ACL and I was out and I was done. And then I had to stay in the investment banking job to get the best health insurance, the best doctor, the best surgery, the best physical therapy. And then I was like, fuck it. I got back. I came back as hard as I could. And then, and then tried out again the following season, made the set, made the team again, made the starting lineup again, and then tore my ACL. Oh my other ACL in the semifinal game. So oh my like, gosh. Yeah. yeah, that's a sign. <laughs> yeah. I was like, universe. Oh, why is that? Got so it. Painful? Here, yeah. yeah. But I got it. Thank you. But, ugh. and so I looked at the second thing on my list, which is to make movies. Okay. And I was like, okay, second thing is to make movies. And I dusted off my film resume. I spent my two summers in LA while I was in college, um, working for the guys that produced dumb and dumber and Kingpin and all these like smart movies. And, um, basically got a job as an associate producer at a production company, you know, like for commercials and music mm -hmm. videos in New York city. Very quickly. I'm like, you know what? I'm not a nine to fiver. I can't do this anymore. So then I decided to go freelance. And while I was freelancing, I, I started like as a production assistant on mm -hmm. sets of commercials and music videos, picking up trash, mm -hmm. you know, for, like on the streets of sets, like driving directors around, getting producers coffee. Like my Asian parents were freaking out. They were <laughs> like, oh my God, you know. But you were doing whatever it took. Yeah. yeah. And, so, and so very quickly worked my way up to producing commercials and music videos. And then while I was on set, I'm sure when you're on, you've been on sets mm -hmm. of things, on set, there was these craft service tables where yeah. they have like, these snacks and all this food. On totally. There. And it's always usually garbage. Like, yes, it is. It like, is always. Eggs in a blanket. It was, totally. Like, like hot dog. It was like cheese fries and pizza yes. and like, you know, M&Ms. And it's it's just, not ever what the talent eats. It's pretzels, always what, yeah. just the crap. Yes. And I was an immigrant's daughter and I had a student loan debt and I was now working on, you know, picking up trash, making very little. And I would just eat that all day long as my meals. Cause I was like, free. yeah, I love free was yeah. my favorite price at the time. And I was just like eating it. I would just come home with awful stuff. Uh Oh, you froze there. Hang on. 
because I just yeah. never thought about it. And finally, I was like, oh my God, I had the worst stomach ache. I came home one night. I was like, enough's enough. And I just researched it. And I was like, oh my God, like, oh my gosh, like the pesticides, the hormones, the antibiotics, the bleach, the chemicals, the preservatives that was in food was just making so many more people intolerant to food, allergic to food, having issues just like you with celiac disease, you know, just like people were just intolerant to all this processed crap. And I was like, oh my God. And I started thinking about my favorite comfort foods like pizza. And I had to give it up too because every time I ate it, I would feel bloated and gassy and stomach pains. And I just couldn't eat pizza anymore. And I just and I just started looking it up and I was like, oh my God, the pizza category is a $32 billion category. Americans eat a hundred acres of pizza every single yes, day. Yes, they do. And I was just like, oh my God, people love pizza. And yet nobody was making pizza for people who had intolerances, who had like issues. No. And food issues, oh, this is 2005. Like 2005, gluten-free was not even a conversation. Yes. Organic, farm to table. Totally. None of those things were being had. So I was like, oh my God, I'm going to open New York City's first alternative pizza concept that had gluten-free flours, hormone-free cheeses, local seasonal topics, organic vegetables when possible. Like, I'm going to support local farms, wow. create local jobs, like do a whole local movement. And everyone laughed at me. And everyone said, yeah. this is, no one's going to buy, ew, gluten-free. Because yeah, no one even knew what gluten was. Yeah. I, yeah. Oh, yeah. I used to carry a card around like what, like to give uh, chefs at restaurants like to make sure it wasn't in anything. Yeah, I'm now sure you must have, people probably didn't know. You no. probably got sick, I'm sure. Like, totally. All the time. So it was just a thing. And then all of a sudden, like, I, so then I was like, okay, I have this idea. Okay, now I have to, like, do it. And, and I was like, I didn't have, obviously, the capital to make it. I didn't have any, you know, I didn't have any of the resources. And so I had just had to, like, gather all of my friends. So luckily, I was dating an architect at the time. You know, I had a friend who was an interior designer. I had a friend who was a chef who I played soccer with. I had like, you know, in my investment banking days, I'd like amass a Rolodex of a few people with money, but I did not even know how to raise money or even have yep. a conversation. So um, guys, can you be quiet really quickly? Yeah. Um, I just didn't have any of the knowledge of how to have the conversations. And so I just first started like, you know, trying to like have one-on-one -on -one meetings with potential investors to talk about yeah. my idea. I would put my investment banking suits on and I would put my pearls and I would just be like a fish out of water again, just like I totally. thought about working investment banking. And I would just try and raise the money and be like, I have this idea and this is what I want to do. And I raised a big fat donut. I've raised <laughs> zero dollars, like nothing. For six months, I just tried raising money, going out, meeting everyone I could. Everyone who I thought had extra pocket change raised zero. What made you not give up in that moment? Like, I'm curious about that because a lot of people would take that first no or maybe the fifth no as a sign. Like, okay, I need to give up. Just like um, when you had the ACL tear, you know, two, the second one, you're like, I'm done. What made you keep going? Wow, that's a great, that's a great, I mean, the ACL tears, I mean, two reconstructive surgeries was just like, oh, too painful. Yeah, I mean, I, I just believe that, I mean, like more and more people were showing intolerances in food. Mm -hmm. There was no alternative to America's favorite pastime. I missed pizza. And yeah. I believe that, the, you know, like the ne necessity is the mother of invention, right? So like totally. I, I had the problem first and I would crave pizza. Sometimes I would just be like, you know what? I need pizza so much that I would just lock, I would go by myself on a Friday night, eat it and just be at my home like, uh, like sick. crying and sick. And I was just like, I knew I wanted this product. So you had, your why was so much bigger than your why not. And that's what I want people to hear because you yes. didn't, it didn't matter what, it didn't matter about people not believing you and it didn't matter about the nose. You were so clear on your vision that it didn't matter. Right. That was it. And I just felt that's exactly it. I was just like, I know that if this food was out there, people would want it. Like, okay. I know that there's a market for it. Like, even if it was a small celiac community or, right. the, or, or like the dairy free community or the organic community, even if they were tiny in 2005, yeah. there was a market for it. And so, so, so Mickey, did you ever get that glimpse of like when someone said no, or this is dumb or whatever they said, do you ever have a moment of should I not be doing this? Did that ever even uh, cross your mind? Of course. I mean, I would, I would be crying. I'm like, I don't understand what I'm mm -hmm. doing. Like, what is wrong? Like, 
what am I doing? And I would just like, yeah, I would just get so upset and I would be, I would, luckily I have a twin sister. And I think when you have a twin sister <laughs> who's like your best friend and champion, you she know, was, like yeah. she'd believe in me. And I, I remember like the, it was like, I raised zero dollars and finally my sister and I were at a restaurant with this guy who wanted to invest in the business. It was like four o'clock in the morning. Right. And she was like, we were at this restaurant and rock, my sister had her head on the table. She was sleeping and I was oh. sitting there talking to this guy who had like, who, who literally like wrote a $25,000 check for my, oh my, my first gosh. investor. And I would, and she was there with me and I, and, um, and finally I was just like, you know what? Like it's four o'clock in the morning. If you're not going to invest, just don't like, I, I, yeah. I'm just, I just can't, I'm too tired. Like you surrendered. <laughs> I surrendered. I just said, and then just, she and I just were walking away and then he like, was like, wait, like dramatically like a movie. And he like, was like, all right, here, just, uh, just, just go do it. And I was like, it was such a New York moment, four o'clock yeah. in the morning, Soho, my sister and I were just like arm in arm. I was like kind of tearing up. So I kind of was like, yeah. you know, like, oh, okay, wow. All right, well, yeah, great. And um, it was just a New York moment. Gosh, what an awesome lesson in that, just listening to you though, because you had to get so past like the, the no and the rejection, like, and people give up before that point, you know, like if you had not done that one more, like just the one more, right? like you were so close to not being there and not going one more at four in the morning. And like you did it and look at what happened. It was such a, and it's so crazy. The first time I'm actually reliving this moment. Yeah. But it was such a, now that I'm talking with you about it, it's, it was such a critical moment about yeah. that realization. That, that was yeah. exactly what you just said, that like, wow, like I could have been like, fuck it. Like, yeah, I'm done. You know, I'm over. I'm and, done. I'm done. <laughs> and, and I kind of at that moment was, but then, but he saw, like, I stood there, I sat there until four o'clock in the morning, just like, like, just being like, this is a big idea. I know it, you know? Yeah. And um, what I like too, is you weren't begging him. You were just pleading your case of your vision. You were just stuck. Yeah. And like, this is my vision. This is what's happening. That's and it. Kind of like, you weren't like, help me, help me. It was just like, this is my vision. And you weren't giving that up. That's it. I mean, and looking back, you know, it's just like, it's like, you have to start with a big vision and share. Yeah. Like, I think that this is a movement, you know, and it's like, whether or not it actually happens, you have to believe in the big vision. Yeah. And, and really understand what that is. You know, it took years for me to even get to the second restaurant and like, and get out of the, just like barely breaking even and really just kind of like, really now is when we're taking off. This is like 15 years later. You know, you think about LaCroix, yeah. La, you know, LaCroix, the drink that now yeah, everyone has, it's a 30 year old company. That's incredible. Like, That's incredible. Yeah. People to think about don't that. even, they're not overnight it. successes. <laughs> they're, they're, it's, it's like a 30 year old a company. And like, like my restaurant wild, mm -hmm. I feel like is now just starting to take off, you know, 15 years later. And I think mm. that, you know, it's just like, it's, it, it has to be the right timing, the right management team, the right, the right, the, the right recipe, you know? And like, we've been, we've been sort of like figuring out the system for so long that I think now we're finally figuring out, like we finally have our franchise package together. We find, was like, 15 years. Mm. I mean, like, and, and usually most of my companies, like I'm like, you know, boom, 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 boom. But certain categories, like the restaurant space, sometimes like, it, sometimes it hits like right away. And sometimes it just takes a long time. Like you just, you know, it's like, but it ain't over till the fat lady sings. Like that is mm. for damn sure. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, so, so yeah. So how do you go from, I love so many lessons in that, that I just wrote down, like so many lessons in that. How do you then like, you, it's like this, oh, I, it finally is happening. I got it. I got, I surrendered. It's happening. Like I'm now going to put a plan in place. How do you then now go like a whole different direction? Like that's happening. But now you're like, I'm going to create another, solve another problem and start all over again. Well, right. How does that so, happen? So, I mean, I ran the restaurants really, you know, for seven years. Okay. You know, so you, ran it, so okay. you, I ran them and I, and I did a pretty crappy job because I didn't have any experience like <laughs> Cause you're the idea person. You're the visionary. I mean, exactly. You're not the integrator or the like doer. Yes. Yeah. And what I realized, and, and so the, and this is another huge lesson was that I ran them myself. Like it was like, I was going, in, I was like yeah. in molasses, like, uphill, <laughs> like I get it. Up, like, barely like breathing. Yeah. And then I finally find a partner who doesn't steal from me. Who yeah. 
like take advantage of me because every other manager was like, this girl's clearly a rookie. Yeah. It would just fleece me dry. And I, at this point, can't even blame them. It would but another fleece. lesson, Mickey, like, look at that because you could have also said, I don't trust anybody. I'm done. Everyone's a scam artist. And, and you kept the course. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Well, interestingly enough, I, so, so I finally, after seven years of like being like screwed over by so many times, the learning and learning and learning and learning, mm -hmm. I finally found a partner who's now my part, current, current partner, Waleed. And, and my first question to Waleed kind of exasperated was, do you believe in karma? <laughs> do you believe yeah. in karma? And his answer was, Mickey, every time I have a bad thought, a bicycle run over my foot. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And I was like, are you the genie from Aladdin? Yeah. You no, know, that was my next question. I was like, so oh cool. my God, like, I love you. And so immediately I was like, okay, we're partners. And we became yeah. like 50, 50 partners and not even shitting you. Within one week of him taking over what I've spent seven years doing, within one week of a restaurant operator taking over, yeah. our, num our numbers doubled. Incredible. Within one month of him taking over, Ugh. our numbers tripled. And I was like so angry with myself, but then also so like, it was such a firework lit moment where I'm like, oh my God, this is what you just said. Like, I need to focus on what I do best, the vision, yeah. the idea, the marketing, the, like, the creative, the thing, and have someone who, who loves operations, who gets it, who loves like the whole, like yes. actually the operations of it does is that that's their zone of genius and we can come together and be amazing partners and that is what was like yes oh uh, you know a huge painful mm -hmm. realization so you know? brilliant but what i also love about that is once again you didn't give up because you could have it wasn't working people are stealing from you I, many entrepreneurs listening can relate to this i can for sure where you start losing trust in people you start was this a mistake maybe i wasn't meant to do this but you kept pushing. You just kept going and you, until you were going to find an answer. I think I, yeah. I mean, I think you have to have a really, really healthy level of naivete <laughs> <laughs> and just be like, Oh, okay, cool. Okay. No, I believe you. I'm like pretty naive in a lot of ways. I mean like, but like, but like, yeah. but I, 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 I'm just, I, I, tr yeah, I think yes. you have to have a healthy level of naivete and just like keep yourself in that space. Cause it's, yeah, but it's hard. It's so yeah. hard because if people prove you wrong, it's like you yeah. start finding evidence that yeah. people are wrong. Yeah. I think I'll also like growing up with, with a twin sister where you have to fight and then like yeah. five seconds later, you're like, you want to get lunch, you know, like, <laughs> That's so and, you know, and you're just like constantly getting or playing soccer, you're getting punched in the face yeah. and then you have to get back up to the next play. You have to just like be so ready for the next play. Even if you lose and you screw up and you lose yeah. and you lose the ball or you, your sister like, beats you down, whatever, like you have to get back up so quickly. I think I just developed a really quick muscle memory to just like, mm -hmm. like, you know, those punching yeah. things to keep like, Woo! and I think your parents yeah. really helped shape you in that because you watch them not complain and they yeah. never gave up. They just found a solution. Let's find a solution. That's it. That's, it. That's I so think incredible. So you find this, this partner, which is incredible and everyone needs one of him in their business. I like that question. Do you believe in karma? That's a great question. I'm going to start using that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Tell me about your next big part, the, how, the, this, the, the transition about, yeah, yeah. The transition and like, because this is, this is so cool. And I love you're constantly like looking at a problem and then not just solving it for yourself, but solving it for everybody. So tell me about that. Tell me about these, yeah. big, all this stuff. Yeah. So, so, so when I put, when Waleed, you know, really took over the restaurants, it really freed up a lot of my energy to focus on this next idea, which is thinks yes. the next. And, um, the idea behind it was also born out of necessity. You know, I would be riding my bicycle from one restaurant to another, you know, and I would just literally have a, my period. Like it was like my first time ever, you know, right. I would just leak through everything, all my clothes, all my totally. stuff was just like, and it gets mess. worse after it gets worse after having a baby. Right. Sure. And you're just yeah. like, Oh my God. And just like leaking through everything. And I would be the one having to interrupt my day, run home and change, be the one in the bathroom, like public bathroom, scrubbing the blood and like under the blow dryer, yeah. just trying to, and it was just a mess. And, and I was just like, oh, this is, this, this is like so ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And at my family barbecue in 2005, um, the same year I, I you know, started my restaurants, my twin sister and I were at our family barbecue and we were defending our three-legged race championship title. <laughs> at our family barbecue. We were 10 year reigning champions of the three legged race. 
And we basically were, as we were sprinting, like in the finish, you know, in like the three-legged race championship final, my sister started her period in the middle of the race. And as we're sprinting through the finish line, still tied to each other in the three-legged race, she started her period and we had to like sprint through the finish line, up a set of stairs, still together into the bathroom so she can change out her bathing suit bottoms and wash out the blood from her bathing suit bottoms. Mm. And as she was washing out the blood from her bathing suit bottoms and I just watched her doing that, the idea hit. Oh my God, wouldn't it be amazing to create a pair of underwear that never leaked, that never stained, and that supported women every day of the month? Mm-hmm. And, we, we, and then Ron and I got so excited. We were like, oh my God, what, a, what an idea. We, we, we kind of burst through the bathroom door and we talked to our older sister. We're like, oh my God, Yuri, my older sister, she's a, she's a head and neck surgeon, my older sister. Okay. She restores hearing for a living. And we were like, oh my God, Yuri, think about it. Every one of your underwear in your underwear drawer has stains in them. Like they all have period stains in them. Mm-hmm. Why is that? Like, why do all of your underwear have period stains in them? And she was like, well, because in the middle of an operation, like a 13, 14 hour operation, you can't be like, oh yeah. Oh, face like yeah. stay open while your fucking whole face totally. is out oh my god can you change my tampon? like you can't do that or like so 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 she bleeds yeah everything, that's crazy you know? i never even would have thought about that it makes sense right and then like you think about like you know me in a soccer game you can't be like yo ref can you yeah. just pause the game i'm gonna change my tampon totally. right back like you can't i the number of times i've bled through my shirt yeah. you know or like when you're performing or when you're stuck totally. in traffic or you're, you know, at like on an elevator or you're in an airplane or you're like making out with a guy or you're like, in yeah, all these situations watching a movie, you can't stop. And you, right. have to, you know, like you can't yeah, guys have no out. idea. The guys have no idea how big it's, of a problem this is. It is. Yeah. And so it, it's like, we need a solution that really solves this problem. So we got so excited. We brought in the third co-founder, Antonia, and the three of us spent the next four, almost four years developing a pair of underwear. Okay. That feels like a regular pair of underwear, like a sexy pair of underwear. Right. Built in technology in the, you know, gusset part that's leak proof, that's absorbent, that's antimicrobial, that's moisture wicking, that's odor proof that really just absorbs up to two tampons worth of blood. It's leak proof. And then you just wash them out and you, and you hang them up to dry and yeah. you're fine. So they're like a great backup to your, your tampon. So or awesome. Or you can use them as a replacement in your medium and light days. If you're a really, really heavy bleeder like me, yeah. I need a tampon with my underwear to yeah. back up. But then on my medium and light days, I wear the underwear by itself. Cause you know, when you're on your period, you put in a tampon inside your vagina and, and it's dry. You kind of have to shove it up yeah. in there. That actually, that's what causes the micro abrasions inside your vaginal walls, which are the more. Wow. Parts. And, and yeah. And if you use like the organic ones, syndrome. if you use the organic ones, it's even, which are better for you, they'll shred if you're too dry. So that's yeah. Right. So they're just, it's just like terrible. Yeah. So there was an, it was such a huge, I mean, huge raging success. I mean, 2005, we, 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 you know, had this, this just hockey stick growth and it really came from another setback. So, you know, we, we were, we were growing and growing kind of steadily small, still in the red, still not making really any money. We, by the way, couldn't raise any money for things. So we had to go mm-hmm. do a Kickstarter campaign. I spent almost a year trying to raise money for things. And all investors were like, la la la, should I be hearing about a period? Ha ha ha. Cause it's all men. And right. so it was so hard. And so we did a Kickstarter campaign and like, you know, finally eked enough money to make our first production run. And, and then launched the company and just, you know, raised a little bit of money from friends and family and just started mm-hmm. kind of like eking by. And really the hockey stick growth time came when um, the New York City public transit system, like we wanted to advertise our sub, our, our, our ads, our, our period underwear yeah. subways in the subways of New York City. And the New York City subways banned us from, from putting our, our, our campaigns oh, wow. on the subways because they said it would be offensive to riders. You can't say period. And oh my we were gosh. like, oh my gosh, what? Yeah. In aggressive city, New York City, you can't say the word period. Oh no, you didn't. Wow. We <laughs> yeah. You know, got our punching bag faces ready. And, um, and we said to them like, all right, well, if you do not put our ads on the subway, we are going to press. Yeah. You know? And they were like, you know, I was definitely like, you know, I was, I was definitely like, you know, hoping that they would say yes because I didn't have any press contacts. Yeah. And um and they called my bluff and they're like, go to press. And I was like, oh fuck. And uh and I was like, all right, well I'm gonna call the two very like light contacts I have. 
and I sent them an email with subject heading scandal with New York City public transit system, <sighs> the word period. And, uh. um, and they both wrote back and they're like, we want to write the story. And I was like, oh my God, really? Okay, okay, you both get the exclusive. Yeah. And they were like, that's not how exclusives work. <laughs> and so it was like a whole fight. I was so embarrassed. And finally, one of them took the story. It was Mike.com. Okay. And the story went viral internationally. You know, Incredible. In City, yeah. You know? And so again, like you talk about setbacks and how we could have been like, all right, well, they rejected our ads. That's it. We're done. Like we can't do it. Or it's like, let's find a different way. Let's turn lemons into lemonade yeah. and figure out a way to make it actually work for us. And it was such a huge... So like almost a twist on guerrilla marketing, but like, it yeah. Apps. And it was like, it got us more press and more yeah. than, than having spent all this money on actually advertising totally. it itself. So it was such a huge, huge thing that, mm. that, that, we, that, that happened. And that's what really put us on the map. We, we went from you know, zero to 50 million in revenue, like so quickly, you know, bad, well over a hundred million dollars. It was a huge, huge, um, exciting, exciting time. I can't even um, imagine. That's incredible. What an incredible accomplishment right that with that. Yeah. Yeah. It was amazing. And then, um, and then, yeah, so really built the company and then stepped down in 2017 as a CEO and, you know, a professional CEO was put in place really from Harvard Business School, you know, who really understands sort of scaling those sort of mid-sized mid mm -hmm. companies up. And then I sort of took, um, I started working on my newest company, which is Tushy. And um, Tushy was born out of necessity as well, which, um, you know, when you think about it, like, Right now we're talking on the, you know, on Zoom call yeah. with Wi-Fi and these noise canceling headphones in this technologically advanced society that we live in. And yet the minute we step into our bathrooms, poof, we're back <sighs> into the 1800s. Like True. literally like poof, back into the 1800s. And like toilet paper was brought to America in the late 1800s and 1890s and popularized okay. by Scott's brothers and Charmin and all these types of people who, I mean, these types of like people who had money and, and sure. companies that can actually spend on creating something that people did every day. And the Scott brothers were like, what do people do every day? Of course, poop. What can we market to these people, you know, to the American consumer that people can buy over and over and over again? And so they, since they had the most money, the most budget, they popularized this toilet paper idea, which now has been a generationally ingrained thing that we use. And when you really think about it, like imagine if you jumped into your shower, right? You, yeah. you worked out, you just had the biggest sweat of your life. You're about to get your periods. You're kind of hormonally smelly. Like you're kind of, you know, like, yeah. you really, and imagine not turning the water on and just using dry paper. Yeah. To no. wipe your body crazy. down. Crazy. People would be like, uh, yeah, what are you doing? Oh, yeah. You're crazy. You know, or imagine if you were like at your kitchen sink. And you just cut up a raw chicken, you know, raw chicken yep. that had salmonella all over it. And rather than using any water at all, you take dry toilet paper and you just, yeah. you know, smear the toilet paper around on this tape on the plate and you put the plate totally. away. Totally. Yeah. It gets a good point. People would be like, what are you doing? And right. Like, you think about what's down there, like the, the E. coli and the infection and bacteria. Yeah. Our, our fecal matter has, and we, we, we go to the bathroom, we take dry paper, we, the, the dirtiest part of our body, we smear it around, and then we sit on fecal matter all day long, which then spreads that, that, that creeps up to our vaginal walls, which then causes urinary tract infection, yep. all these issues down there, vagin, bacterial vaginosis. And then of course, people who use wet wipes, you're stripping away the natural oils from behind, causing anal fissures, anal itching. So you're just like, and then of course, toilet paper, when you're using it on your butt, it exacerbates, and you're, you're, you're rubbing so much to try and like get it all out. Which, which helps promote hemorrhoids. It's a really like art. And I mean, I, what's crazy is that no one's uh, brought this up or thought about it before I'm hearing this from you. <laughs> and, right? And it's just yeah. like when you, because, because again, it's so deeply ingrained in society. You kind of go to the bathroom, you use toilet paper, you kind of- You don't think about it. You don't that's, think about it. that's all that people know. That's it. But when, but when you actually think about it, like, wow, yeah, there's 30 million cases of combined, your chronic UTIs, hemorrhoids, anal fissures, anal itching, all these things because you're taking dry paper and just smearing poop around and yeah. sitting on that all day long on your computer, on your phone, just sitting on it, which is just like, it's crazy. And, and, um, when you think about like, 
you know, what's the universal solvent? Water. And you think about in Asia, bidets are ubiquitous. And you think about Europe, bidets are everywhere. South America and Middle East are bidets are everywhere. So what we've created is, is this, what we've invented is simply a modern bidet that, okay. that looks like this beautiful iPhone next to your toilet. Yeah. It easily attaches to your existing toilet. So it clips onto your toilet in 10 minutes and turns any toilet into a bidet in 10 minutes. And there's no plumbing or electrical required. It only costs $69. Okay. It's not like those super expensive Japanese toilets which cost thousands yeah. of dollars plus plumbing, plus electrical, or those weird French bidet things next to a toilet where you have to like shimmy over with your poopy butt to like <laughs> wash your butt. Like, I don't even know what people so, do. So, you know what's coming up for me? This is so funny. And because so many people think of bidet, like, because Amer- especially Americans, they're trained so backwards with toilet paper. They look at bidets and they think it's like dirty toilet water coming up. But what they're not understanding is it's not, one. And two, like, what's the alternative? What you just explained is so much grosser than than water. Like that's, it, that's, that's crazy. It's crazy. And by the way, it's not dirty toilet water. It's the same water you brush your teeth with. Yeah. So it's, it, they're pulling the water from the wall. So, yeah. so, so our product, so it comes a little splitter in the hose. Everything's in the box for the $69 and it comes with a splitter in the hose. So it splits off from the wall, the same water that goes into your tap that you brush your teeth with that goes into, you know, that, yeah. that feeds into your bathroom. So it's not the toilet bowl water, the toilet tank right. water. It's the water from your wall, same water you brush your teeth with. And then also people's big misconception is like, oh my God, like, well, poop just fly and spray everywhere. And the answer is no. It's like a, a it's like a precise shower for your butt where the water <laughs> precisely is pulled into the toilet bowl. And it's like, it take, it's so, it's like you can sip champagne. Oh my gosh, Mickey, you're like, so funny. You know, it's like the most yes. clean, pristine high-end experience for $69. I mean, it's like- We're all ordering this now. Like we're all yeah. ordering that. We're all yeah. ordering the things that we're all ordering. Yeah. So and by the way, by the way, super, super important. Do not go to tushy.com. It's like the most graphic anal porn site. Go oh my to- gosh. Go to hello tushy.com. Okay, can you spell that? Hello, hello. yeah. H E L L O T U S H Y dot com. Hello tushy.com. Okay, so no, we're not going to porn no site. Tushy, no we're porn not, site. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Hello tushy.com. <laughs> That's yeah. hysterical. So check it out. Yeah. I love it. Oh my God. You're just incredible. I love your energy. I the things that I'm picking up from you, so I mean if nobody's told you this, or if you don't know this about yourself, they're so evident to me. Like one that you don't take no for an answer. You're so committed to your vision and problem solving that that tops all of your why not. So like no one can talk you out of anything because you are so completely committed to it. And I hope people really hear that because it's not, you are so not a victim. Like so many people would, you could have taken any one of those stories and become a victim around them and given up every single one of them. And because you were so true to your vision, it didn't matter. It like, there was no victim mentality. You were just going to find a solution and you weren't waiting on somebody else. And I think that's just such a powerful lesson. And going back to the soccer story, because what I heard is you stopped because of the ACL, it was also not in your vision anymore. So your why not became bigger than your why. And that's the difference right there. So like, if you really wanted to be a soccer player, if that was so in your, your, I'm sure you would have found a way. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that I always knew that it's just like, that it's, it's, there's a, there's a bigger world changing sort of plan ahead. And I think soccer was a good lesson and stepping stone and it was the right, like it helped me sort of push through all these challenges that was going to come, come forward in my life. I think it really served its role and served its purpose in such a powerful way. But I love what you said about the victim mentality. I talk about that in my book, Disruptor Mm -hmm. all the time about the idea of like, you know, like complaining is for procrastinators. And I know that people like we can, we can easily play the victim about anything in our life, just like you said. And, and it's like the, it's, 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 it's like, and, 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 and again, we we, like, there are shitty things that happen to everybody. We have all experienced shitty things that feel like so out of control and out of alignment within who we are with what, what, you know, it's like, it's real, like being a victim. Yeah can be real for people, but it's really like, it's really like, like that happened. And then the rest is now a story that we're just repeating, yes. repeating and repeating and repeating in ourselves. And it just becomes, it becomes a crutch and it does this victim mentality just does not help us live our best lives. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that the more we catch ourselves in that victim mentality and being like, Oh my God, I'm complaining again. I'm complaining again. I'm yeah. Complaining. 
It's like, I'm just delaying the possibility of the Got magic it. that's ahead. I'm just delaying. Mm. The, I'm just delaying the future. I'm delaying like all the joy that's ahead by just replaying this over and over and over again. I talk about that in my book as a chirping in your brain. Like we're just chirping and chirping and chirping and chirping about all the things like the judgments and the perceptions, yeah. and the what ifs and the, I can't believe that this happened. And I, I, all the things that just, just keep, and it just, the, it's kind of like, you know, when you, when you see a tree with like so many birds in it, yeah. it's, like this, it's just like one loud incessant chirp and you don't even know yep. where it's coming from. Yeah. That's like all the thoughts in our, yeah. Brain. They're like 60,000 thoughts a day that we have. Right. And it just gets, it consumes us. And so when it does, we just compl- have no space for anything else. And I talk about all the time in my book, like how to become a warrior gatekeeper of your mind, Mm. like how to really catch all of the things and just be like, okay, no, I am in control of everything in my brain. I'm in control of what I allow to be, you know, truth or not factual or not, or a judgment or not. Like I'm going to just catch them and be like, nope, not today, not today. That's judgy Judy. That's mean Margie trying to come to my gate in my brain not letting that happen today. And when you do that, you're like, oh my God, I, I now have the space to keep dreaming, to keep believing in all the things I want to do, to, to keep doing. Like, okay, so now that I don't have any of these fucking annoying thoughts in my head, I'm now going to be proactive. I'm going to call this person to go and shadow him for the day because they built a company and I want to know how they did it. Mm-hmm. And you just have like all the space to create again. And I think that's so, good. so important. Mickey, I have one final question and, and I'm absolutely adding your book to my Amazon cart. <laughs> it's coming and I need to know more. What, if I ask everybody that I interview this question, I'm going to ask you this and I'm going to ask more about where people can find you and all the things. Um, if somebody is listening to right now and they're in their own personal rock bottom, so maybe they have their ACL injury or their relationship has fallen apart or financially they're in that spot where you were eating craft services because that's all you could afford, whatever their own personal rock bottom is and they're in that spot of I give up. I don't know what to do. If you were to give them three things right now that they can do to start shifting and start thinking the way that you do, what would you tell them? I think, I think it's really about putting one foot in front of the other and it's actually nothing beyond that. I think we, we, we have really a lot of analysis paralysis and actually when we okay. start taking action of any kind, like okay. literally just saying like, I'm going to call two people today mm-hmm. or I'm going to go and meet this one person today. I'm going to do this action today by just, by just actually making a to do thing. Even if it's one or two things, you'll start being like, Oh wow, I just made progress. Or, Oh wow. Like I just fed off that person's energy. Oh wow. Like I'm no longer in this thought loop in my head. Like I'm actually now in a forward. Yeah. So any action, I love that. Any Any action action at all. Um, I think also it's really, really important to take stock of who are your five friends in your life. And I I think the five most closest people in your life, you know, it could be a family member, a a friend, a colleague, you know, and just assess what are they saying to you in your ear. And it's Mm -hmm. like, you are the average of the five closest friends you keep, right? So we are the average of the five closest friends we keep. And, And by friends, it's like, again, a family member could be like, stay in your safe job. You need to quit. Like, what totally. are you doing? Why are you? Or your spouse. Yeah. Or yeah. your spouse or someone who's trying to hold you back and they're doing it because they think it's the right thing for you. Yeah. They're doing it out of love and they're doing it out of compassion for you, what they believe is right for you. And mm. so it's not like they're, 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 they're bad people. They're just not acting in alignment with what you are aligned with. And so I would, I would really try, and I know sometimes when we're at a rock bottom, we want to re- grasp and reach out to everybody that we can think of and to commiserate what we're and to commiserate and be, and they'll be like, well, I think you should, and I think you should, and don't you should. Yeah. Or they and, tell you it sucks. Like you're right. That sucks. Yeah. And it just, it just becomes again, like, it's like, I don't know, because now everyone's telling you different things and you just, again, are paralyzed. So I would, I would actually suggest, this sounds like so crazy and, and, and so like, duh, obvious, but honestly, like doing a, 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 a 15 minutes a day of just not of like closing your eyes and a bit of a meditation experience. Mm -hmm. And I do like, you know, I I know that's like, Oh, meditate, blah, blah, blah. Like everyone's like, yeah, meditate. It actually does help you resolve so many things and have quiet time and actually like I come up with my 
best ideas when I meditate. Like so my good. best things I do, I, I literally, and I'm not saying that because I'm just like, oh, man, people close their eyes and are like, look, mm-hmm. you know, I actually, I do, I do transcendental meditation and Dr. Mm-hmm. Bob Roth is my teacher. He taught Oprah. He taught, you know, Seinfeld. He taught Ray Dalio. He taught, mm-hmm. you know, all the, Gwyneth Paltrow, he taught so many of sort of the, the movers and shakers um, in our culture, how to meditate. And they all swear by it, including me, because it's not like, don't think, oh, every time you have an active thought, you're like, fuck, you know, I can't meditate. I'm the, it's, what transcendental meditation is, it's actually, it's really cool. It's actually effortless. It's actually, it's actually a vacation from okay. the vacation of your active thoughts. And so you're just basically like, you know, thoughts come and go, but instead of thoughts coming like in the top of an okay. ocean where it's just like, oh my God, I thoughts are, it's just like so crazy up here. It's just taking those thoughts down below in the ocean where it's quiet. Ooh. Like at the bottom of the ocean when it's quiet, the same thoughts still appear, the same, you know, so you're not letting go of those thoughts. You're not so trying- they're just not the hurricane like all spinning around. <laughs> it's just not yeah. like at the top yeah. of the surface where there's waves right. and crashing and you're just like, ah! That, you know, yeah, that's where I live a lot. So I, I understand the hurricane. <laughs> right. It's just like bringing yeah. it all down. Oh, so good. And then when you do that, it kind of just like, and then you have a mantra, which, which isn't like mantra, 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 thinking right. your thought, like, oh, like I'm thinking about it. It's kind of like, you know, when you walk to the subway or you walk to your car and you yeah. kind of know where your car is. Like, you know where the garage is, you know where your- Well, it depends. I never remember where mine is. But okay. Well, okay. So pretend <laughs> like you're walking- Okay. So you have your- Right. But you have your favorite juice spot, right? Yeah. You know where it is, your favorite spot, you know where it is. Yes, I do know not, that. And you're not like thinking, like walking, like I'm walking to my juice spot. I'm walking. <laughs> you know, it's kind of like your body just- Yes. Yes. Dips, right? Subconsciously. And it's, that's your mantra. Your mantra kind of like is your guide that kind of it's like your compass that kind of helps bring you back. You're not yeah. like, I'm walking. You're not like thinking your mantra. like so dr- You're just like, it's just a guide. It's a light effortless guide and it just sort of like brings you back and when i and like for someone who's as high octane as me or as you or as people who are just like constantly moving really fast totally that time is so important for me to just like have that space and that beat to just like all right like i get to breathe again i get to think again so So i think when you get in the like hurricane because i'm sure it still happens like oh yeah when you get in that is that the time you go and do it or do you have like a set time that you do it no, no. When you get into the hurricane space, you're like, all right, I need, I need that. The last thing you feel like doing when you're in the hurricane, but that's when you need it. But, but then you, but then you actually like when it actually is when you need it. And then you're like, I'm just going to, I'm going to take five or I'm going to take 10 or I'm going to take 15. I mean, 15, I would say is the minimum, like 20 is ideal. Okay. Um, but 15, you know, it's 20 is really ideal, but 15, I would say is a minimum to really get you from like the heart palpitating, like yeah. vibes to like really breathing and like really just like, you know, I also, I also have, and this is another thing I would do for these people. When I was going through like the really cha- most challenging times in my life, I put reminders in my phone, like take three long, deep breaths every oh. hour, every hour I had a reminder pop up. And I still do to this day, these reminders pop up, take, take three long, deep breaths. I have another reminder, which is the right way, not right away. You know, and that's another reminder that pops up twice a day because I'm usually like, I just want to move things fast and I just want to do, do, do it. Just like resolve. And she's like, oh, you know, and I get sometimes I'm writing that down. Yeah. It's It's like, and so my girlfriend told me, she was like, let's just, why don't you do things? Why don't we talk about doing things the right way and not right away? Oh, so good. And I'm like, that's my new screensaver right now. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, exactly. And that's been, that's been one of my mantras like over and over again, the right way, not right away. And, And I just have these little reminders. And another one is, when I'm upset, when, when you're upset, did you drop down? Because when you're upset, like in your operating yeah. from your root chakra, I'm like, and then you, and then I can't believe it. Blah, yeah. blah. Like you're, but when you drop down to your root chakra, that's actually your true soul. That's your true self. And when, when we're like going through like internal struggle mm-hmm. and all this shit, and we want to like be at our throat chakra, did I drop down? And the way, the way I dropped down is I put my feet on the ground and I just, I just like, plant my feet on the ground and just be like, all right, like I'm, I'm like back to my root chakra and I kind of sit up tall and I just like, again, just like plant down and I'm like, okay, I'm operating from a place that I don't want to, I sound like a crazy person right now. Right. Like I'm not being myself. I'm being like, not, I'm being like irrational or I'm being unkind because I'm just emotional. 
So when you kind of like root your feet to the ground, actually doing a physical action, I talk about in my book, Disruptor, all about pattern interrupt. Like when you're like in these like high yeah. like moments, you have it's like it's like a baby crying. Whenever your baby cries, like you have to change the position. You right. have to like go outside, or you have to take the baby and like look. Oh, look at that! You know, yeah. and you kind of like pattern interrupt their like escalation because shit escalates quickly, right? Yeah. And so when we escalate quickly in our minds, we pattern interrupt really fast. But so and it's as simple as like walking outside and walking back in and taking a second. So just all these little things, I have these reminders in my phone. So I would suggest those, those things to do too. Just put so good. reminders in your phone. Oh my gosh. So much good information today. Okay. Where do people find you? I know I, I just looked like literally as I'm talking to you, I know you can get your book on Amazon. I'm assuming anywhere books are sold. Is Amazon the best place or where do they go for your book? Disrupt yep. yep. Amazon. So you can okay. go. This so my first book is called do cool shit with the subtitle. Okay. Quit your day job, start your own business, <laughs> and live happily ever after. Love it. And, um, and that's really about how to really come up with your business idea, how to raise money for the first time, how to get press for the first time, how to everything I did to go from step zero to step one in business and life. So that's like, dude, that's okay. beautiful shit. And then disrupt her. It's basically, it's a manifesto for the modern woman. And it's looking at 13 major areas in our lives where we just need disruption, like in our career, money, the concept of needing more stuff, like yeah. the concept of perfectionism, like, you know, even feminism, patriarchy and all the shit we can't talk about. Like, yeah. It's just like just facing all these uncomfortable subjects and being able to find alignment and power within all the major areas in our lives. So that's sort of, it's just disrupting then, everything. Um, for the, so t- check out, for the tissue yeah. paper thing, <laughs> hello tushy.com. Yeah, hello tushy.com. And then definitely check out my Instagram page at Mickey Agrawal. I would love that because I'm, as I'm sort of like okay. building it out. And then, um, and then I just launched a, a monthly, so just a once a month blog called Mickey's Monthly Musings. Okay. Where, and then you can just literally, if you go to mickeyagrawal.com, there's a subscribe button in the top bar and you can just subscribe there. Got it. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So awesome. Following you on Instagram right now. Okay. Everyone, if you liked this episode, please comment, rate, review, screenshot it and share it, especially on Instagram. Tag Mickey, tag me so we can see that you, you liked it and share your thoughts with us. And thank you, Mickey. I'm so excited. I thank you for doing this today. Thank you so much for having me. It's been so fun. Thanks for leveling up with us today. Please share this episode if you found it helpful so others can join in. And don't forget to hit that subscribe so you don't miss out on future shows. And if you would leave me a five-star review, I appreciate those so much. I read all of them and it's how I know that I'm giving you information that you find valuable. And come interact with me over on Instagram at Natalie Jill Fit. I read all the direct messages and comments over there. Make it a great day creating everything from nothing.